God's country, Arizona. And uh, if you uh, are ever out our way, we'll like glad to have you. But uh, c call us when you're coming so we know we can go on vacation. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, I'll say hello to them. Also, I'll let you know that in November, we have a Bible conference. It's the weekend before Thanksgiving. So if you just go to butnow.org and uh, click on the information, it's all right there. We'll be glad to have you. And you can come out, and that's a perfect time to visit. Is that loud? It's really loud. Yeah. Roo. Do a little Barry White, you know, yeah. Right? No, I don't know. Hey, you, the guys were talking about reminiscing and so forth. Um, we'll be celebrating 20 years at Southwest Bible Fellowship in uh, August. We're going to have a little thing in, at the Bible conference, but I was sitting there looking at that sign over there, 83, thinking about things and, and everything. And uh, you guys know who Fred Beckemeyer was? One year at the men's meeting on the, in the old building on Neva, now, Sunday night, the crowd goes from big, you know, very to little. So Fred was teaching, and before he got up, he's like, he's like, hey, uh, come on down front, folks. There's seats up front here, you know. He's, and uh, I backed the camera out, and the room was empty, except for a few heads. <laughs> so so if, you have, if you got that tape, you got a classic, okay? But uh, anyway, on Wednesday afternoons, usually the, um, this is all commercial. By the way, you need to get Ezekiel chapter 40, Ezekiel chapter 40, 1 Kings chapter 10, Ezekiel 41, Ezekiel 42, Ezekiel, go to Ezekiel 40, okay? I meant to tell you that, get started here. On Wednesday afternoons in, the, in previous years was always the family picnic, so you'd go to the park reserve and have a, play baseball or softball get hurt, get injured, you know, the whole bit. So I always had to have something to wake you up because I was on Wednesday night, you know. And so I'd try little things and usually wouldn't work, but the jokes did. And I was told that I was a rather funny guy, but uh, I don't get any respect for that. So, <laughs> but uh, there's a couple of kids. I, I got a few jokes, okay, for you just to kind of warm you up, wake you up. I got, where's my, they were for him. Where is he? All right, well, they're for you now, okay? A couple, a couple of little, uh, two little boys, age 8 and 10, they uh, keep getting in trouble. Mom and dad are just at the wit's end, so they take them to the preacher at the church down the way. And uh, he agreed to talk to them. So the, he calls in the little 8-year-old, sits him down, and the preacher looks at him and sternly says, Where is God? The boy made no response. So the clergy repeated the question in an even sterner tone, where is God? Little boy, again, no attempt to answer. So now he went the other, the preacher went, where's God? You know, yelling at him. Little boy still, boy, he bolted from the room, took off, ran into his brother, and his brother goes, what happened? He goes, I don't know, but God's missing, and they're blaming us. <laughs> so... There you go, okay? Now you're, now you're awake, right? Yeah, there you go. That's like the, you heard about the preacher that gets to the pearly gates and the taxi driver? You didn't hear about him? Now, pearly gates means it's a what? A joke, okay? So this is a joke. He gets to the pearly gates and the taxi driver's there with him and St. Pete says, come on, I'll show you around. He takes the taxi driver around, gives him the big mansion up on the hill. Preacher's going, wow, if he got that, what's my coming my way? Takes the preacher down, he's got a little back-end cabin on the back end of nothing on the other side. Pete goes, wait a minute. The preacher goes, wait a minute. Taxi driver gets a big man, and I'm down here on the bottom of the knoll with nothing. He said, well, yeah. Every time you preach, people slept through your messages. When they got in the taxi, everybody prayed. <laughs> I'll try not to put you to sleep, okay? All right, my title this evening, we'll get started now. You can start recording and all that good stuff. Uh, my, my thing this evening is the coming kingdom. And uh, again, my topic, uh, as the gentlemen have said already, is, is very uh, vast. When we begin to talk about the kingdom and the transition 
which we call the millennial. Now, it's not millennials in the kingdom. It's the millennial kingdom, okay? And when we begin to talk about the millennium as a transition into, how long is the kingdom going to last? Forever, not a thousand years. Forever. We're going to see it in just a minute. See, I already failed. So let's pray. <laughs> it's a doomed... No, what's going to happen here is when we begin to look at the transition, there's a lot of stuff in your scriptures about the kingdom. You got Ezekiel 40, right? Look at verse 1. Ezekiel 40, verse 1. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, the fourteenth year after the city was smitten, in the selfsame, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon every high mountain by which was the frame of a city of the south. And boom, guess what? He begins to lay out the city, doesn't he? We're not going to look at that. Don't worry about it. Chapter 42. <laughs> chapter 41. Afterward, he brought me to the temple and measured the post. Six cubits. We're not going to worry about that either. Verse 42. Chapter 42. You just keep going right on. Come over to chapter 48 of Ezekiel. Folks, you can spend a lot. My point is, is you can spend a lot of time looking about the kingdom and the millennial and what's happening and what's going on in the kingdom. In chapter 48, which has been kind of hit on a little bit here, if you look at verse 30, and, and these are the goings out of the city on the north, 4,500 measures, and the gates of the city shall be at the names of the tribes of Israel, and on and on you go. And you know what you begin to do? You begin to figure out what a reed is, and you begin to figure out what a cubit is, and you begin to lay this thing out, and you know what? It's a big place. Okay, just one little portion of it is 3,600 square miles. You think about how big that kingdom, the temple, those chambers. When the Lord looks at the, uh, the uh, little flock and he says, I'm going to go and build a mansion for you, and you're thinking, you know, Donald Trump. He's not thinking Donald Trump. He's thinking something else in his kingdom, in his city, in his temple. There's a lot going on there. You, you, you go 1 Kings chapter 10. You don't have to go there. Solomon, wonderful picture of the kingdom. Remember Solomon? Who was his dad? David. David wanted to build the Lord a house, didn't he? Lord said, you ain't building me a house. Your boy is. Here's the blueprints. You get involved. You get up there laying all the supplies. And Solomon builds this big, I mean, beautiful. So much in 1 Kings 10, Queen of Sheba comes up and says, the half was not told. We're not going to look at that. Come to Genesis chapter 1. By the way, the reason we're not is we just don't have the time, okay? I'll be honest with you. This evening, again, my goal is to look at that transition period, what we call the millennial, as we're going to move into Genesis chapter 1, the beginning of the eternal kingdom but also there's something else going on at that same time with you and I in the heavenly places. And I'm going to say this, and you just pay attention. You and I are kingdom saints. <gasps> what kind of kingdom? Heavenly kingdom. Okay? Now, if you go around telling people you're kingdom saints, they're going to misunderstand you. All right? That's why there's only a couple places in Paul's epistles where he talks about a heavenly kingdom. We're going to look at those. But there's a transition happening here. Look at Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse 28. Look at Adam. Charlie did a great thing this morning about the dust thing. I never thought about that. I'm like, I'm write that thing down and use it, you know. <laughs> well, you know what they say. When you steal from someone, it's called plagiarism. But when you steal for two or three, it's called research. So it's research, okay? Look, look at Genesis 1. Look at verse 28. Look, I want you to notice something very careful when he talks about man as we get going this evening. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. We're good so far? And then he says to them what? Subdue it, and have what? Dominion over it. Day one of Adam's wonderful life, what did God just tell him he was going to be? 
a king. From the very beginning, that's why you will read verses and it'll say that the kingdom was talked about since the foundation of the world by the prophets. Because what is God's issue here? It is a kingdom. God's prophetic program and the calendar and everything that's going on, it's about a kingdom, isn't it? Come over to Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel chapter number 2. The wonderful thing about being like in the evening like this is you can use things and if someone else talked about it, you don't even remember. So <laughs> Daniel 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44. You know the thing if you've been in Kenny's uh, seminar this week, this week, or if not, get it online or get it on the DVD and pay attention to it. What happens? We got a vision going on of kingdoms, reign, rulership. And Daniel 2, verse 44, here's the whole goal of everything that God's doing, starting with Adam. What's he say? Verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a what? Kingdom which shall never be destroyed. How long is this kingdom going to last? It's going to last forever. It's never going to be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms and so forth. We saw some of that last night with the Battle of Armageddon in the Valley of Jehoshaphat and the Valley of Decision, didn't we? What's he establishing a kingdom, and it shall never be destroyed. Put that in the back of your mind. Come over with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to have to move forward here. I think about that destruction. We're sitting at home, and, and I tell you what, where I'm sitting at, in, at home, and I'm watching all these tornadoes going on in the middle, e, middle uh, Midwest there, flyover country, and I'm going, why in the world would you want to live there? I mean, I know 115 is hot, but come on, you know? <laughs> The, see, then, I, then it dawned on me. You know what I would do if it was in a tornado? I'd stick hot dogs in my pocket, then the search dogs would find me first. <laughs> you know? So, Matthew chapter 6, okay? Matthew chapter 6. In, the, in the, great par, the great phrase here that everybody calls the Our Father prayer, there's something very interesting in it. Verse number 10. What does it say? What does it say? Thy kingdom come. What are they looking for? They're looking for a kingdom. Now, that's, that's very interesting, I think. Deuteronomy 11, verse 21, Moses says when the kingdom comes, it'll be as the days of heaven on earth. Thy kingdom come. The Sermon on the Mount here, five, chapter 5, 6, and 7, where the Lord is describing the citizenry and the saints and the activity of His saints in the kingdom and the character and what this is going to be all about. And He says, what are they looking for? They're looking for that kingdom to come. So there's a problem then, isn't there? It should have already been here. But we got a little fall. We got a little stumble. We got a little Romans 9. We got a little Romans 10. We got a, little Rom a lot of Romans 9. <laughs> and a lot, right? We got mess. What are they looking for? They're looking for a kingdom. Acts chapter number 1. Acts chapter number 1. I failed to start this, Dad. I apologize there. But I know what time it is. I have a watch. <laughs> And a, and a broke watch is right two times a day, right? And it isn't the time. So Acts chapter 1, what do they ask? The, Lord has been, the, the Lord's been crucified, hasn't he? He's been buried. He rose again the third day, right on time, right when he's supposed to. He goes and he takes the apostles and he opens their understanding of the scriptures. He spends 40 days with them in verse 3, alleging to them the things about what? Things pertaining to what? The kingdom. So in verse 8, the natural question is what? Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Very interesting question. Very interesting way it's worded. They don't say, will you bring us the kingdom now? Does it? It says, will you restore again? You know, they've had a picture of this with David and Solomon and, and what it was going to be like for God's man to be on the throne, didn't they? And then those wonderful courses of judgment kicked in. But notice, what are they looking for? They're looking for a kingdom. So what was on their mind? A kingdom. 
That's on their mind. Come over to the book of the Revelation. Boy, I tell you what, you want to look at the, the kingdom out there in the future. Revelation chapter 20. What are they looking for? They're looking for a kingdom. They're looking for their Messiah to come and establish and do what he said he was going to be doing since day one. Establish and set up a kingdom with, as him as the rightful ruler and the rightful king, and they're in their places. We're back here, aren't we? Now we're in here. Then we jump over, because we're coming back to that in just a second. And now we're over here, aren't we? And then we get into this thing about a millennial. Now, it's an interesting thing. Look at Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the, of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he, and he laid hold on the dragon and the old, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him, how long? You know, that's where you get the millennial idea from, is right there. In all of the Old Testament scriptures, there is, I, I haven't found it, so I'll just say from what I've found. If you find it, you come let me know. I'd be, love to see it. There's no mention of a thousand-year delay. There's no mention of a thousand-year reshape that we've been hearing about. There's nothing back. You know what it is? It's boom, 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 boom. In Acts 1, when they asked that question, what, by the way, what was the Lord's response? Not quite time, is it? Why is that? Well, what did God do back here? He established, uh, hey, we're going to do this, but before we do that, we're going to do this. Follow that? We're going to, hey, Moses, you're going to be my guy, but before, you know, you know, what did he do? Off he went. Noah, we saw it. We've seen it already. I love that thing in Noah. Noah, go build a boat. It's going to take you 120 years. <laughs> but what did Noah do? He went and did it. There's that delay. There's that reshape. There's that whole. And you know what, Israel, when they, when he, when they, when he, when the, in Acts 1, when the Lord says, it's not quite time, guys, they didn't go, doggone it, man, you're doing it again. They said, yeah, that's, that's how things have been rolling. <laughs> well, that's how we're going to do this. But I want you to understand the thousand years, the millennium. It's simply just that. It's a transition period that's going to take place. It's going to do some things. It's going to establish some stuff, and we're gonna, that's what we're going to look at. That's going to then bring in the rest of the story off the page. Come over with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy, chapter number 2. Are you with me? All right, good. 2 T Timothy, chapter 2. Revelation 20 has a thousand years. First time we see it. We go, okay, what's going on? Then there's a little guy by the name of the Apostle Paul who showed up. And what did Paul begin to do in, his, in the revelation given to Paul that he writes to you and I? What does he begin to do for you and I, as well as for the nation of Israel? He begins to drop in little nuggets of information, doesn't he? That begin to help Israel understand what's going on with them and to help you and I understand what's going on with us, but also what's going on with them. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. What does he say? Consider... Hey, oh, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in some things. How many things? What's the next verse start with? Remember, there's the problem. You consider it, you ponder it, you study it. By the way, considering is not reading. Considering is into it, digging. Boom, this is what we're doing. We're going here, we're going here. Boy, look at this. We start over here with Adam, and he's got dominion. By the way... You, I hope you go and read Noah. When Noah got off the boat, you know what? The Lord did not say to Noah, subdue and have dominion. Go read that. Something to think about. He said, replenish, fill it up, but he left off subdue and dominion. Very interesting. Look at that. We got all this 
Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Oh, we're going to consider, we're going to study, come over to Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read, we're going to think about, and we're going to remember some things here about Israel's Messiah that Paul reveals. And that Paul says, I want you to look at this and remember this and think about this because the issue with God, Daniel 2.44, is what? He's going to have a kingdom on the earth that's going to roll and reign and run everything else, right? There's crickets. I say right. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. Brother looked at it this morning. I'm sitting there going, okay, you can stop, stop, you know. Ephesians chapter 1, look verse 9 and 10. Chapter 1, verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Did Israel know the, the mystery of his will? The answer is no. Did they know his will for them? The answer is yes. Clearly they did. Romans 3, uh, Romans 2, Romans 3, they go and they search it and they know it and they're able to prove it from the, wor the oracles of God. Paul's talking about a mystery. What's the mystery? Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Paul is going to give us some further revelation, some, some further details when we begin to think about the thousand-year period leading into the kingdom. And he's going to plug some gaps that you see a little bit of in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the earthly ministry of Christ. But if that's all you had, you wouldn't understand it. Look at Matthew. Come back with me to Matthew. Matthew, chapter 3. We'll look at Matthew. Matthew depicts the Lord Jesus Christ as the king. We're talking about a kingdom. We're talking about the transition period. Now think about this. We've come all the way across time, haven't we? Stephen falls. The interruption happens. You and I go home. We go to be with the Lord in the air. We, we meet him up there. The 70th week of Daniel starts. Some things are going to happen. We're going to look at that here in just a minute. Second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Does he come back? To, uh, I got a joke, but that's okay. He comes back what? Nice and neat and prim and proper? No, he's got that sword on his thigh. He's on, what's he doing? Blood up to the bridles of the horses. Over there, he's covered in... Who's this guy... Died in red, coming out of Bozra and Edomia. Who is this? And the guys behind him are all speckled. If you've ever been around horses, what happens when they kick up the mud? The guys behind them just kind of get sprayed. He's what? He's covered. He's been hard at work. He gets the job done. Now, I'll just say this because of time. In his second coming, there are at least five or six different things he's doing and establishing for Israel other than just the battlefield, okay? But they come after the battlefield because he's got to win the battle before he can institute some issues. Follow that. We go in to the kingdom. Matthew chapter 3. Oh, J.B. shows up, John the Baptist. What's he say in verse 1? In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness and saying, Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is what? It's at hand. It's right there, guys, for you to take. You got to repent. You got some things to do, right? Talking about that little flock. Chapter 6 of Matthew. They go along. They don't like John. They behead him. The Lord goes out. Actually, if you come across there, well, I'll just go to chapter 6 for time. Sorry. Time. I, 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 I was sitting there listening to, to Alex the other night and to John, and, and I'm like, you know, they got it nailed right. There is so much to look at here. So I'm just trying to pick some treetop stuff for you. Look at Matthew 6. Look at verse 33. But seek ye first the what? The kingdom of God. And his what? 
righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And the things there go back up, and you start in verse 25, and you see the list of the physical issues that are going to be taken care of for them out there in the kingdom. But what are they to seek first? The kingdom, aren't they? Why? And his righteousness. Why? That's the promise. That's what it's all about for these guys. Look at chapter 25 of Matthew. On your way, stop and... Well, go look at Matthew 20. Well, get Matthew 19. Matthew 19, they're continuing on. The Lord's training the 12. He's chosen them out. He's picked them up. He's, you guys are my guys. I love that thing in John 15. He chose them and ordained them. <laughs> he goes, you're mine, and this is what you're going to go do. And he puts them in the ministry out there, and they're out there preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I love that thing in Luke 8, verse 1. He's preaching and showing. He gave them the power over, over the sickness and the, and the illnesses and the what? Those, those bad guys, the devils, and casting them out. He's got all this stuff going on for them. And then old Peter, here in Matthew 19, he says, hang on a second here. i got a question. Verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all. Had they forsaken all? Yeah, they had. They'd given up everything for him. And sometimes people read this passage and think Peter's being a little self-centered, but he's really not. He's asking the right question. We've forsaken all and have followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Peter's not looking for a, amen, praise the Lord, happy day, good day. No, he, Peter understands there's some things coming in that kingdom, and that's what he's after. And what does the Lord say to him? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What is He doing with those twelve guys? What's He doing there? Peter says, what do we get? And he says, you're going to get a throne. What's He doing here? He's establishing His what? His government. He's establishing the, the men who are going to be in charge of the, of the ruling and the reigning and the, infra, and, the, and the issues of the kingdom that's coming. It's still at hand. It's not there yet. You've you, you got to see that for this to make any sense in my mind, okay? What is he doing here? Chapter 21. Chapter 21. Verse 43, he's looked at the 12. He says, you guys are going to be sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Matthew 21, he's talking to the Pharisees, gets over into it with them. Verse 43, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, that's the Pharisees, that apostate nation, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. What kind of fruits were they bringing forth? The fruits of the kingdom, the fruits of righteousness, the fruits that were, they were designed for them to do. But notice who, who he's talking to here. He's, the twelve are on the thrones. What are they judge? Who are they judging? Boy, I wish I had a chalkboard. Man, you guys, some of you guys are glazed over. And we're just getting started. He's twelve, th the twelve apostles are judging who? the 12 tribes, that he just said he's going to give them the what? The kingdom. See that? What's he establishing here? The government and the governmental structure, chapter 25. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. Now, again, Paul said what? Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. In Ephesians 1.10, that over there in the dispensation of fullness of times, he's going to gather together under the headship and the rulership and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ all things, whether they be where? In the earth. Who's in the earth? Who's the earth belong to? Israel. What did he, what's he doing here? He's establishing the governmental structure of his kingdom in the earth. Matthew 25, verse 31, we're over in that kingdom now. And notice, and when the Son of Man shall come... Again, the future for them, but here we, here's a picture into it. 
and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them. By the way, this is not the nation of Israel. It's all nations. And you got the goats and the sheep, right? Now keep, I, I need you to look at verse 34. He separates them out. And he, uh, well, verse 32, just read the passage. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate one, uh, one from another, for a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. What's that next word? Prepared. Notice it doesn't say promised. Was the kingdom promised to the nations out there? Never. It was promised to Abraham's seed, wasn't it? Genesis 12. Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So where are we? We're over here in the kingdom, aren't we? Not in the kingdom. Who's standing in the room with the Lord when he makes his proclamation? Well, we know his holy angels are there, right? But who else is there? I would give to you the 12 apostles as they sit on the 12 thrones, as they sit over the 12 tribes of Israel. Because what has God promised? Again, I wish we had the time. You go back and he's going to restore their princes. He's going to restore their heads. He's going to bring them back. Remember the patience of Job. Remember what I did with Job. You guys got it. Because you endured through that 70th week. Come back with me to Ezekiel 37. What's the Lord doing in his earthly ministry? Ezekiel 37. He's established his governmental structure, has he not? He's got the king. He's got the 12 thrones. He's got the 12 tribes are going to be up and going here. We're going to see it in just a minute. But he's going to do something else with them. In this tra Now, we're, I, I want you to be thinking about we're into the transition here, the, this beginning of the thousand years. Look, if you will, at Ezekiel 37. It's a very interesting passage here. You start in verse 15. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man... Take thee one stick, write upon it, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Who are the two sticks? One's the house of who? Judah. One's the house of Israel. What's he going to do in that kingdom? Put them back together, right? Okay? Verse, you, you, you read on down through there, verse 20, and the sticks were... Whereon thou writest shall be in thy hand before their eyes, and he's going to put them back together. Uh, verse 22, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. Isn't that interesting? What's he going to do out there in that transition as he's establishing the governmental structure of his earthly kingdom? He's going to bring back who? He's going to have to resurrect who? Verse 24. Who is that? And David, my servant, shall be king over them. What's that mean that's going to happen here after the second coming? One of the components is going to end up being the issue of what? Resurrection. And all the Old Testament saints, all the way back, is they're going to be resurrected into the kingdom. And who's there? David. But who is David? He's the king. So now, the picture, you have King David, you have the 12, and you have the 12 tribes. You're having a functional government reestablished, aren't you? You can talk to me. Where's my amen corner? Okay, you can talk. That's what they're doing. That's what's happening back here in time. He's establishing. Close the chart. None of this. And one day he's going to bring it to fruition. 
Okay? You would not have known that if you did not know Ephesians 1 verse 10. What does Ephesians 1 10 say? That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, what's he going to do? He's going to gather it all back up underneath the headship of who? Christ. All things. Government. Where? In the earth. And in heaven and place. The reason I say it that way is because did they understand what he was doing when he was establishing everything? They didn't until he opened their eyes in Acts 1, didn't they? And he, they began to come, give the things belonging to the kingdom. By the way, run over to Matthew 8. Matthew chapter 8. Folks, you need the Apostle Paul in your Bible to understand what's going to be happening prophetically out here because he drops in little nuggets that go, aha, I got, now that makes sense. That's why Peter will tell him, look, you guys got Paul, you better be studying him, but you better rightly divide him and be very careful with him. Because Paul is going to tell you that circumcision availeth nothing, and we understand that that's the case for the dispensation of grace, but we're not there now. We're over here in the ages to come, and you've got to be on board. You've got to catch these little nuggets that come through. Look at Romans 8. I'm, I'm sorry, Matthew 8. Look at verse 11. Very interesting verse. He's healed the centurion's servant. In verse 11 the Lord speaking to him, and, and I said unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, where? In the kingdom of heaven. You know what that means? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob got to be there. <laughs> if not, the Lord's a liar. And you know what that also means, by the way? When they walk up, you know what they're going to say? How you doing, Mr. Abraham? Good to meet you finally. I've read all about you. Instant recognition. Not a, hey, 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 come over here. I need you to meet Isaac. Isaac, what were you thinking crawling up on that altar in Genesis 22? You know? You're not, they're going to instantly know these guys. Instant recognition. Come over to, well, you're in Matthew, so get Matthew 28 and get Revelation 20. Matthew 28 and Revelation 20. What's going to happen in the transition time for the nation of Israel? What has the Lord done? He's established who? He's established His government, hasn't He? He's established, He's resurrected the Old Testament saints in. He's got King David in His place. He's got the 12 apostles on the thrones. He's got the 12 tribes out doing some things. Revelation 20. Matthew 28, look at Revelation 20. What are they going to be doing? Revelation 20, you drop down there to verse number 4. And I saw thrones. Now, by the way, who's, who's been bound up? Verse 1, 2, 3, Satan bound. Now we're into that thousand years, aren't we? Real quick here, it's simple to see. What does John see? I saw what? Thrones, notice it's plurality. It's a plural thing. How many thrones did he see? How about 12? And they sat upon them. Who's the they? The 12 of, hello, 12 apostles. What are they doing? Judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And, and, be, and what did they do at the end of that verse? That he saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of the God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and had a nice vacation and was fishing out of the stream of life, catching rainbow trout. No, and what? Rained. What are they doing? Go back to Matthew 28. They're over here doing what? They're getting on with business, aren't they? Why? That's the whole program for them, isn't it? To reign, to rule. Revelation chapter number, well, you got Matthew 28, right? You still got the book of Revelation? If not, go back, Revelation 2. You were just there, I know. I apologize. Revelation 2. Look at Revelation 2, verse 26. 
And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Plural. The Gentiles. What's he going to do with them? He's going to give them power and authority, and he shall, what? Rule them with a rod of iron. Now, I'm, there's a lot going on in those verses. What I want you to see is the simple fact that they're in the form. They're there doing what? Reigning and ruling and applying the justice and the judgment of the law without mixture. Ecclesiastes, you, you know the verse, a, a sentence delayed and not swiftly executed is trouble, isn't it? That's the RJ version, okay? What ha you, they're going to instantly enforce the law, Matthew 28. They're going to instantly go in and they're instantly going to do, and just as a brother the other night said, when Satan's loosed over there after the thousand years, people are not going to be happy with Jerusalem. They're going to be on, on edge and Satan's just going to come up and push them right over and deceive them. And the 32nd firebomb out of heaven is going to come and zap them. And the next thing you know, they're done. But what I'm looking at here in the transition, what's happening? He's establishing the government of his kingdom. Look at Matthew 28. Most people say this is a, the Great Commission. <laughs> and Thanks for playing. At the, end of, at the end of all four Gospels, the Lord gives a little addendum of what's going to happen at specific times through the 70th week and the and end of the kingdom and this end period of their time. And in Matthew 28, here's what the 12 tribes are going to be doing out among the nations. Look at Matthew 28. Look at verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. You know, he didn't have that before. In Matthew 4, when the devil tempts him, he didn't go up there and say, Hey, wait a minute, Bubba, you're wrong. All power is mine. He has this where? After Calvary, where he won the victory and the right to say, All power is mine. By the way, what else did he do? In the second coming, what did he demonstrate? All the power was his in heaven and in earth. So what Jesus said to him, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. You need to write down Numbers 23 and verse number 9, where Israel is not numbered among the nations. What is the little flock going to be doing now? They're going to be out amongst the nations, and what are they going to be preaching? Well, they're going to be baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, which it was the law, Matthew 5, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. What, amen. What are they going to do? Not only has he established his governmental authority, David's in his place, the 12 are on the thrones, and the 12 look down at the 12 tribes and say, go to it. Here's your commission. You know it. They have the new covenant in them. They're not looking around going, hey, do you know the Lord? The Lord, they know him. And what do they do? They're out there doing what to the nations? Doing these verses. That's happening in the transition period. They're moving forward, aren't they? They're doing something. They are working. So in the transition for Israel we have some conclusions of some matters that started way back in the prophets. Follow that? Go back to Ephesians 1. Are you with me? Ephesians chapter 1. I drive a water truck for a living, construction site, dump trucks, big trucks, little trucks, medium trucks. And the guy looks at me and he, I'm on a we're on a major freeway construction project right now, and he looks at me and goes, you feel me? <laughs> I go, I feel you, man. If you don't get off my truck, I'm going to get you wet. <laughs> but you, you see what's going on here? What does Paul say? Verse 10, hey, he's going to gather together and one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. What's the earth? The earth is done, isn't it? Who's in place? Talking about the transition into the kingdom. 
Second coming's done. New covenant has been installed in them completely. It's not, a, it's not a temporary issue. It's a permanent thing. They're out there. King David sits on the throne. The 12, tri the 12 apostles are in their place. The 12 tribes are out doing the evangelism issues and the nations out there that they're supposed to be doing. By the way, have you ever wondered why there's 24 elders in the, room, in the, in the throne room in Revelation 4 there? Deuteronomy says that the earth is going to be divided under the number of who? Israel. How many? How, what's that number? Twelve. The, the, the earth has been divided into twelve. Each tribe's got their section and off they go. But what about the other twelve? Because there's 24, right? What's going to happen to the heavens? Hey, it's going to be divided out again. And it's going to be worked on because not only does God have the plan spoken of since the foundation of the world about Israel, in the transition is going to take place, but also in that transition, he's doing something else as well with you and I as members of the body of Christ. And I got 20 minutes to do five, six, seven, hour, eight hours of study with you on this, but just hold on, okay? You, 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 you feel me? Okay? You with me? All right? Come over to 1 Thessalonians. And I just want you to get the flow. And I just want you to get the flavor here. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And again, I, I, folks, you have to understand, me and my water truck, we're buddies. And my water truck, since when did we get our assignments? About two months ago? We've been having conversations about the kingdom and I'd start over here and I'd say, man, we're going to do this. We'll look at the ambulance and the wealth. And Well, no, that ain't going to work. And I tell you what, if that dashboard could speak, it'd preach a good message. Because I preached it to it. <laughs> okay? Look at 1 Thessalonians 1. Just, just look at verse number 10 with me. What's happening with you and I? And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the what? What are we waiting for? We're waiting for his son, aren't we? By the way, notice that word delivered is past tense. It's already done. I love that. Well, you know, you guys are going to go through. No, that verse says, I have already been delivered. It's like that verse over in chapter 6 of Romans where we usually say we're free from sin. But that's not what that verse says. It says we're freed. There's a D at the end of that word free. It's already done. Glorious freedom. We are delivered. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for the Son, aren't we? Come over. Chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 2. Look at verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 19. Paul by the way, at the end of each of these passages, he gives you details about what we call the rapture. I'm not trying to get into details. I'm just trying to see. I want you to see something here. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his come? Now, which coming is it? Is it the second coming? No. Please say no. Okay. It's this unprophesied Mystery coming, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, isn't it? Look at chapter, look at chapter 4. I love chapter 4. You start in verse 15 and run down to the end of that, and you see him, the Lord himself shall come, uh, shall descend, verse 16. The Lord himself, in Israel's program, he sends the angels out to gather them up. The Lord himself comes. Makes a little racket up there, wakes everybody up. Some of you he's going to have to jerk twice to get you out of the world. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There's a predestinated meeting going to happen. We call it the judgment seat of Christ. Isn't that fantastic? You go over and study that out in 1 Corinthians 3 and other passages in chapter 4. Of 1 Corinthians and chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, and you begin to see that you know what's going to happen. What happens at this moment in, in 1 Thessalonians 4? What do you get? You get your new body, don't you? Amen is right. But you still got some issues, so we're going to put you through a little fire. You know, turn the fire. At home, we can't have fires, it'll burn everything up. We have them anyway, and we burn everything up, so why not just have them and get it over with? But they don't like that. 
What comes out, who, you come out on the other side of the judgment seat of Christ. Come over to chapter 3. You got a new body. So we know the judgment seat of Christ isn't a bad thing. It's a glorious thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a day of rejoicing. In 1 Corinthians 4, he says, And all men shall have praise of God. You come out on the other side and your inner man has been through the fire. And the wood, hay, and stubble has been the, those human effort, the human work. The religious activity is whoo, gone. And left standing is the gold and silver and precious stones, the wisdom, the understanding, and the knowledge that you've built up into your inner man. So that verse in Timothy when he says, Godliness is profitable now and has the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come, what you're doing now impacts your future. But notice something here with me. You got this issue about service, don't you? That's the whole... By the way, Israel, we didn't look at it again. Man, it's just so much. The apostles are arguing. The Lord steps in and he says, you guys got all this wrong. You think reigning in my kingdom is like the Gentiles think. Ain't nothing to do about it. It's about what? Service. Being a servant. You know what it is? It's for you and I. Oh, but no, Rick, I'm judging angels. Really? Have you ever really thought about that? what it means to judge angels. You ought to think about that. What's going on here? What's beginning to happen? Your capacity for service has been identified based upon the capacity of your inner man to go and to do. Now, look at chapter 3 and look at verse 13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. When does that verse happen? Notice it very carefully. What has happened? The calls come. Shout, the voice, the trump, boom, we're out of here. We're new bodies. We're in the presence of the Lord. We're having a great reunion, aren't we? As the song says. We go through the judgment seat of Christ. The capacity of our inner man is identified. It's labeled. It's stamped. There it is. Here's your capacity for service. And what does, the, what does that verse say that the Lord does? Look at it closely, how that ends. He, in the holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. When does that happen? We meet Him in the air, we go through everything, and then what does He do with His body? Takes us to the presence of the Father. And when he takes us to the presence of the Father, you know what the Father says? Well done, my son. They look good. Come over with me to Philippians. Get Ephesians 5. You're going to get Philippians 3, but we need Ephesians 5 first. It's very interesting. Now, what does all that have to do with the transition? Because that's happening over here, before, you know. Well, meanwhile, back at the ranch... What's going on? Well, some things are being fulfilled, and it's time to get the covenant signed. You see, folks, when Paul says that our t taking home, our resurrection into the new body is happening in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the rest of this stuff slows down because this is a glorious day for the Father and for the Son and for the Holy Ghost. It's a glorious one. Why? Because here's the church, the body of Christ, complete. Look at Ephesians 5.27. He's talking about the church. That he might present it, the church, to himself, a glorious church, without not having spot or wrinkle. Boy, what a day that'll be when you don't look so... Anyway. <laughs> or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. I think about that. I think about that lamb that Israel was to go get for the, for the Passover. It was to be what? Without blemish. Boy, this is going to slow down a little bit. When the father looks over there and he says, Hey, son, they look good. Look at those guys. They're fantastic. Well done, my son. Well done. 
They're fitted now for what's going to happen with them. And he, the Father is going to take us then. And he's going to begin to dress the heavens with the body of Christ. But before he does it, there's some things that got to happen, right? Now, before we go do that, look at Ephesians 3 and look at verse 20 and 21. Well, Rick, you're off your knock rocker. Probably, but that's okay. I enjoy being off the rock. I get out on the limb all the time, and Joe usually saws off the limb for me, okay? <laughs> Ephesians, look at Philippians 3, look at verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. Philippians 3.21. Did I, what did I say? Philippians. Come on, you, I already said it twice. <laughs> Philippians 3.21. I'm sorry. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? What's that body going to look like? His what kind of body? Glorious body. Notice it's not resurrected body. Isn't that interesting? Remember, he meets up with the ladies, and he says, what? You can't touch me yet? I haven't been where? I haven't been to my father. I haven't completed the deal. i got to get up there. Then he comes back and looks at Thomas and says, feel me? Come on. Here they are. T touch me. Got anything to eat? <laughs> I like that. Huh? Eating. Whew. <laughs> Look at what he says. Now, watch the end of this verse, because this, this is the linchpin and what's happening in the transition here. According to, you ought to take some time, by the way, and look at all the according to's. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue. Have we seen that word before tonight? Genesis 1.28 with who? With Adam. Subdue all things unto himself. Subdue all things where? On the earth? No, he's got that covered with Israel, doesn't he? But now where? In the heavenly places. What did Ephesians 1.10 say? What's the plan? What's the mystery of the Father's will? We're going to get it all back underneath the rightful headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to use Israel. we got the structure set. And I'm going to come over there and I'm going to use a bunch of no good, dirty, rotten, stinking dogs, dustmen. And we're going to make this whole new... And we're going to do that in the heavens. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. There's a little thing going on in the heavens. In verse 7, there's a little war in there. Just a little one. It's just a skirmish. He looks over there. You got Revelation 12? Go get Isaiah 34. I told you. This is the easy. I, I, I love that verse where Paul talks about the simplicity that's in Christ. So I got a mantra that bangs around in my head. Keep it simple, stupid. So instead of running 80 verses, and we've only run maybe 79 so far, then we got just these little ones that kind of sum everything up. Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Notice that word place. Where are we going, folks? Heavenly what? Places. Locations, geographical areas, things that are there, right? Look at Isaiah 34. Hold on to Revelation 12. Look at Isaiah 34, verse number 4. and all. I'm sorry, verse 5. For my sword shall be bathed in what? Who's, what's going to go on up there? We saw last night with Brother John. There's a war going on up there, isn't there, in the heavenly places. Where are you and I, by the way, when this is happening? We're in the presence of who? The Father. He's taken us and presented us up out of the battlefield, if you will. And the Father looks at the Son, and again, this is just my trying to figure, illustrate this. He looks at the son and says, go to it now. They're mine. They look good. I'll take care of them. You go finish the job now. The voice of Mike, the archangel, Michael, just tell me to go, Lord. <laughs> the, the troops are ready. 
Just tell me to go. And he says, let's go. Hold on to Isaiah. Go back there to Revelation 12. They lose their what? They lose their place, don't they? Verse 9, Revelation 12, 9, And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil. He's, they lose their place. He's cast out. Go back to Isaiah 34. Now look at verse 4. Isaiah 34, 4. And all the host of heaven shall be what? Well, if you're dissolved, what did you lose? You lost your place, didn't you? They come in and say, Rick, we're sorry. We've got to let you go. Guess what I just lost? I lost my place, didn't I? They're all dissolved. Keep reading. It gets even better. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Why would you roll the heavens together as a scroll? Well, keep reading. And all their hosts shall, what? Cast, be cast up, fall down. You know what the Lord's doing over there? In, the, in that first half of that week, in the heavens, that war going on, He takes that heaven, that, 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 that curtain He spread out there, He's going to split coming down. We saw last night with John. Remember that? You better. <laughs> I'm counting on you. <laughs> okay. And he, he's going to roll that thing up, and he's going to shake it. And when he shakes it, he's going to shake it back to the way he wants it. In that original, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth condition. And then he's going to, Roll it back out. And when he rolls it back out, there'll be those 12 sections sitting there. There'll be those places of authority for you and I, for the Father to take you and I and say, go, there you are, you go, you go. And they begin to fill them up. Come back to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, look at verse 10. Revelation 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ for the accuser of of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. What's going on up in heaven? Yay. Woohoo. Yay. No, what's happening? Yeah. Look at what's going on. The sun, the, those cre that old creation that groans and travails till the sons of God are what? Manifest. Guess who just got manifested in heaven? You and I did. And you know what the heavens do? they begin to sing again, and they begin to rejoice. Look at verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that what? What is that word? Dwell, dwell in them. When you dwell someone somewhere, what are you doing when you dwell there? You, you buy a home that is called a dwelling place, is it not? When you own a home, are you looking to sell it and move out two days? What are you doing? You're living. Remember that thing in Ephesians 3 when Paul says that the Son, that Jesus Christ might come and dwell in your hearts by faith? Comes and does what? You're at home, aren't you? The only place for me, only personal opinion, where the body of Christ shows up in the book of the Revelation is right there. Because of the use of the word dwell. Let me show you how. You with me? I got one minute and 30 seconds. It ain't going to happen, but you got it. Come over to Hebrews chapter number 12. Because usually what happens when I say stuff like that, go, oh yeah, but what about? Well, let me just talk to you real quick about a what about. Revelation 12, and look at verse 22. I'm sorry, Hebrews 12. Thank you. See, they're paying attention up here. <clears throat> the rest of you are Going to sleep, but we'll get there. Hebrews 12, verse 22. Hebrews 12, 22. But ye 
are come into Mount Zion unto the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and to the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to the God uh, and to God the judge of all and the spirits of just men made perfect. You see that issue there about the heavenly Jerusalem and the general assembly and all? And that, who is that? Come over to Revelation 21. Who's sitting in the new Jerusalem? Revelation 21. Well, nobody's going to answer now. Right? That's okay. What's Revelation 21 verse number 9 say? And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit, and the great and the great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Who's the, who's the new Jerusalem? Who's the heavenly Jerusalem belong to? And where's it going to end up? It ain't dwelling in heaven, is it? It is not dwelling in heaven. It's where? It's on the earth. Who's dwelling in the heavens that would be rejoicing? Now, don't get me wrong. I think Israel probably rejoicing too because they understand what's happening. But who's dwelling in the heavens? We are. What are we doing in the heavens? Come over to Ephesians chapter 2. We're in... We're in the home stretch. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. You and I, when we go up and we meet with the Father, and we go through our process and everything, he begins to lay out. There are seven titles given in the Apostle Paul, in, 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 in Paul's epistles, about rule and reign and government and structure and offices. You got principalities and powers and mights and dominions and thrones and rulers and every other name that's named. you got a whole list of them, and he begins to take you and I, and he dresses us, and he puts us out there in the heavens. Ephesians 2, verse 6. What's happening in the transition here with you and I? We're beginning to do what? Fill up the heavenly places, are we not? Did I not? Okay. Revelation 12 is in the midst of the week. By the way... Don't say middle. Daniel 9 calls it the midst. If you say middle, they're going to nail you. A guy nailed me one time. I said middle. He said, so on 1,245.5. Right? I'm like, what are you talking about? He said middle. No, it's midst. The verse says midst. In the midst of the week, there what's going on in heaven. There's a war. There's a battle. There's a cleaning out. The heavens. And we begin to dress that, don't we? Ephesians 2, verse 6, what are you and I doing in the transition? Well, we're doing this. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What are we doing up there? We're sitting together, aren't we? We're sitting together in the position that the Father has set us in, in the form of governmental service and rule and reign. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, notice it's a plurality there, not age, but ages, what are we going to be doing? He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. What's He doing? What are we and I doing? Israel's on the earth in the transition. They've, he's established His kingdom in the earth, has He not? Come over to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter 1. He's established already Israel, taken care of. He's established you and I up in the heavenly places out there. What are we doing? What is Israel doing in the thousand years we're talking about? They're ruling and reigning and they're going out doing Matthew 28, aren't they? What are you and I doing? We're showing off, aren't we? those exceeding riches of His grace. And we're ruling and we're reigning and we're doing. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians 1, verse 16. Verse 15, for uh, who, and talking about Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by Him were all things 
created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created uh, by Him and for Him, and He is before all things. By the way, what are the all things? That governmental structure, right? Verse 18, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence would mean what? Top dog, right? He's the big guy. I got a Bible from Hawaii. One of the tribes, they call God the big guy in the sky. That's what we're talking about, preeminent one. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. Now watch verse 20, because here it is. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether there be things in the earth or things in heaven. What are we talking about? The governmental structure, aren't we? You see, folks, in the transition, that thousand years, there's a lot more going on. I just wanted you to see what Paul shines a big old light on that time, and he says, you know what? Here's where you and I come in. Here's what's going to be happening with Israel, that establishment of the governmental structure. He's already back here with them. He laid it in. He lays it in with you and I. By the way, he lays it. You got time for one more? Okay. 1 Corinthians 15. I like her. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> I like that. I got a few people you should talk to. 1 Corinthians 15. I, I tell you, folks, when looking at this and the subject matter, it, 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 it's so big. But in that transition, there's something very just simple going on that usually we get awestruck by the, the, the grandeur and that we miss the simple thing of he's setting up what's going to, the dispensation of fullness of times out there will start and continue. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 24. Then cometh the end. I like that. <laughs> Every man, you're talking about the, the, the order there and out of verse 20, 21. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. How does that end? It ends with a period. What a statement. But when he saith all things were put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, I, I'm sorry, accepted, which did put all things under him. Now here you go. And when all things shall be, what? Subdued unto him. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. You take the end of the book of the Revelation. Jesus Christ is the Godhead bodily manifested and praised and glory and raised. But over there in that kingdom, after the thousand years are done, what's after that? Great white throne judgment. Then we get in Revelation 21, we get that new heaven and new earth. And you know who gets exalted and praised? The Godhead does. All three. Because he had a plan from Adam to subdue everything on the earth. He had a plan before he even started to subdue the heavenly places with you and I. That begins to be placed into position in that thousand years. Can God do two things at one time? Sure he can. He's God. And at the end of the day, you know what begins to happen? He gets the praise. And he's exalted as the preeminent one. What, thy kingdom come. The kingdom come. It's coming. And there's a transition into that kingdom. You know, you go read in Revelation, no more sorrow, no more hurt, no... And you go, wow, look at that. But you realize that when he calls you and I home, you and us home and resurrects us home, we get that instantly. We're not waiting. We got it right there. 
Can I show you one more verse? Oh, I tell you. Look at 2 Timothy 4, I promise. I'm, I'm over and I apologize and I'll take the wrath of mom, no biggie. Look at 2 Timothy 4. Paul is at the end of his days. He's going to die. He knows it. He's been talking to Timothy, letting him know what church history is going to look like after he leaves. The epistle is going to conclude the canon of Scripture. And he says in verse 18, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's why I started when I said a minute ago, an hour ago, that we're kingdom saints. But what kind of kingdom are we? Heavenly kingdom. I sit and I look around this room and I know there's probably someone sitting here going, what in the world is this guy yakking about? And what, who, who drugged me here? If you're here this evening and you don't know if you're ever going to make the heavenly kingdom, you need to make sure you're going to make it. Room this size, there's always going to be someone who needs Calvary. Both programs that we've been talking about centers around Calvary. If someone were to ask you, where would you spend eternity, you better have an answer. Heaven or hell. The God of the Bible says, choose life. Don't choose death. Well, how do I choose life? It's simply taking his word where he says that I died and paid for your sins. And trusting him. You don't have to walk an aisle. Which aisle would you walk? There's like eight of them in this room. You don't have to walk an aisle. We don't have to have an altar call. You don't have to come down here and shake my hand or anything. You just simply in the privacy of your own heart choose him as your savior as the one who died for your sin. And you know what will happen? He'll say, I'm glad you chose life. Here's eternal life, and i got a job for you. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. If you're here this evening and you've never trusted him, you need to do that today, tonight. See me, talk to the guy that brought you, talk to a bunch of people around here who will be glad to talk with you but you need to know where you're going to spend eternity. Because everything we talked about this tonight is based upon people that know where they're going to spend eternity. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word, and above all, we thank you for your Son who went to Calvary and died for us. And while we look at these things in the future and we can rejoice in them and we can speculate about them and we can have fun with them, what counts in the end is where we spend eternity, and we're glad that you took care of that on the cross. We thank you for everything that is said and done, that it be for your honor and for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.